you are new to working with myths and archetypes on the path of the soul, or perhaps you felt that call to go deeper, you will find this episode with teacher and author Mike Myers incredibly inspiring and also helpful. We discuss why it is so important that those of us called to the path of the soul do this. We reclaim something that our culture has said is irrelevant, and yet it couldn't be further from the truth. So if you're feeling that call, this will be an incredibly illuminating episode for you. Let's dive in. Hello, Mike. A huge welcome back to the show. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here again. Looking forward Mm. to it. And to show our range and flexibility, last time we talked about the Kabbalah and Tree of Life. This time we're not talking about Kabbalah and Tree of Life at all, or probably not. And we're talking really all about working with myths and legends and archetypes, I guess, in, in service of the path of the soul and for both of us, that's something that's very dear to our heart and something that um, we spend a lot of our time thinking about, talking about, working with others with. Um, so I'm personally really looking forward to diving into this one with you. Well, me too. Definitely. I'm waiting for your questions. Fabulous. So let, let's, again, start at the beginning. And it's funny because last time we spoke... I asked if you'd share your own story to how you ended up with the love of the Kabbalah and um, working in that way. And I think you did touch briefly on the work you do with the round table, but it clearly wasn't um, a core part of the story. So this time I'd like to go back again (laughs) and pick up that story from when you felt that call and for me it really does feel like a soul call those of us that have been um invited into this more like mythical worldview it feels like this deep call from soul that for some of us happened you know way back when we were children and then at some point we realized like oh this is something more than just for me so i'd love to hear the story of how that happened for you well yeah happy to share it um well, briefly, I don't know if I touched upon that the other day, um, but for me, it all started also within the childhood days. And uh, of course, as a child, you're very open to uh, mythologies and stories and fairy tales um, <clears throat> for at least a certain while. Mm. And then it withers away. And I always say then, the, the frontal cortex, the neocortex in uh, neurological terms takes over and the archi, archi cortex at the back of the head um, from archetypes, it slowly withers away and the interest is no longer there. But that didn't happen with me. So I was very interested in particularly knights and uh, medieval times. And of course, because of that, the round table. Uh, But apart from that, any mythological story, whether in book form or on telly, um, and also to act it out, I found an uh, an incredible uh, potency within it already as a kid, and Mm. it never left me. So I thought somewhere there should be something for adults as well. This is not just a kid's story. Um, So eventually through it, I found through what we call the Western esoteric tradition, I found that there is indeed a way to work with myth in general and with the round table mythology and Camelot and the Holy Grail in particular. So that, uh, that was a journey in itself and, mm. uh, and still going on. And out of that um, initiative eventually and that development over the years, I became uh, acquainted with people, especially in the UK, actually, um, who are connected to mystery schools. Um, of course, what, like I said, in the Western mystery tradition or esoteric tradition. And um, yeah, they use the myth, particularly the round table, 
to psychologically but also practically work uh, and and develop yourself as a human being. So it becomes a soul journey. Mm. And um, I, in turn, have done the same thing here where I live in Holland in my own school, so to speak, where I teach Kabbalah and other things. And the round table is a very important um, part of that curriculum. As a matter mm. of fact, tomorrow we have another round table meeting here every two weeks. And um, that's going on for 13 years. And the material is still there. And it's like inexhaustible what you can do with it. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Um, you said there at the beginning that most of us tend to reach an age where we lose interest in mm myths and fairy tales and yeah. when you said that the question came up for me mm. around whether that's um a kind of natural process that we do just grow out of it or whether it's more of a um, product of our modern culture that mm. dismisses the role, the power of myth and archetypes, and so conditions us to lose interest. So it's, it's less of a kind of just natural growing out of something, and it's more um, a conditioning out of it where we no longer see the relevance, see the potency. I was speaking personally, like you, I had this um, such a pull to myth, legends, fairy tales, uh, fantasy books that that's what i used to spend all my time immersed in um mm. as a child and i look back and i don't know this for sure i think some of these things are quite hard to really tease apart in any sort of real sort of anything re remotely scientific kind of looking back but i have a sense that i I just thought, well, this has no purpose. <clears throat> you know, this this is a almost yes, it's this, you know, something that I love and has like real richness and meaning to me personally, but doesn't really have much purpose in the world outside of that, outside mm -hmm. of my own little bubble. And yeah. I find it interesting that I actually chose one of my A levels was in classic classical civilization, which was sort of going back and looking at some of the more uh, you know ancient Greek stories. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat's going as I as I suspected it might. Um, I keep gulping down tea, <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I find that intriguing. That, that I wonder if that was almost a, a, it was a subconscious attempt to me, like, oh, perhaps there is a way of making this passion I have for myths and legends, sort of like making it proper, you know, like I can actually right. do an A-level in it, um, but then didn't really find at that point an application for it. So for a period at least, apart from the odd time where I'd, for example, get uh, absolutely obsessed with, uh, I don't know, the latest Harry Potter book coming out, to a large yeah. extent, I'd kind of left that part of me behind. So coming back to so that, that's what's behind my question. I noticed that many of us, even with that very natural and perhaps longer lasting call to myth, Mm. at some point did feel this sense of it has no value. I'm meant to leave it behind. Um, yeah. So I'd love to your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, first of all, I think that especially the Western world, where we are coming from and living in at the moment, um, has a kind of, especially since the times of the Enlightenment, uh, which, of course, is more like a cerebral development mm. in, uh, in our culture here, uh, didn't really promote any kind of, well, religious or spiritual uh, development per se, not per se against it, but it didn't. And at the same time, uh, it wasn't really embracing any of the mythological and uh, romantic stories, but much more the scientific, empirical um, uh, texts and uh, and uh, developments there. So I think that that is a problem if you can call it a problem and um and you can see, well i found sometimes that uh like parents of children they can't distinguish because of that 
the different languages that the brain speaks. Mm. So, for example, the neocortex, the frontal cortex, uh, it's it's logic, it's ratio. It will say, you know, it doesn't make sense because to me, thinking from here, um, it doesn't exist. So, mm. and some will go as far as to say it's a lie. So Santa Claus, uh, which is a famous uh, archetype and also a semi-legendary figure in Holland and Belgium who comes every year to Holland. Um, well, they say, I'm not going to, to, to uphold this story for my children because it's mm. a lie. And that's just a miscommunication between the two parts of, of the brain. And of course, it both speaks a part of the truth. And that is, I find, very important to know where what is coming from within the psyche. Uh, mm. And, and I'm, I'm pointing at parts of the brain, but of course, it's also outside of the brain. But this is just a device of how to register what is going on psychologically. This is pure mm. personal and this is archetypal or transpersonal. And the archicortex is much older. So the archetypal stories and the mythological stories um, yeah, are much more rudimentary than the later developed neocortex, who mm. sometimes just runs the show and thinks that, you know, he's the center of the universe or she. And, yes. uh, but if we can let these things talk in their own way and understand what the languages are, uh, then we, we have something good, I think. Mm. And, and you said something, uh, if I can just elaborate on, in, in regard to Christianity, this is the problem when we still try to, um, from our cognition, try to always interpret the biblical stories. Mm. And you will find out that some of the stories didn't happen or hard to believe, or they do not resonate literally with the world of today mm -hmm. after six or 7,000 years. But if we try to explain them from a mythological and metaphorical approach, from the archetypal cortex, then they become alive again and they tell a story which is relevant for the world of today. Mm. And that, that's something I think we have poorly developed here and lost. But still there are cultures who mythologize their whole life. You know, with death, they have a ritual and a song and with sowing the land or washing and whatever it is. Yeah. Mm. And unfortunately, we, we lost that a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I think that's such a helpful way of describing the is not to say that either part of the brain is not needed or is wrong. It's that mm. both are needed. It was reminding yeah. me as you were talking of the way that in our modern culture, often we use that word myth as meaning it's a lie. It's not true. <laughs> Yeah. Whereas there's a way of relating to myth, um, and this is a paraphrasing of uh, Joseph Campbell, where mm. it's, you know, perhaps a myth has never happened, and yet it's always happening. In, yeah. in the way you just said, there is a way of relating to myth in which we yeah. allow it to come alive. We allow yeah. it to illuminate things that are happening right now in our lives and are yeah. just as pertinent to this modern world as they were back when they may or may not have actually ever happened. Sure. Mm. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And, and that's seeing that the myth talks in a psychological uh, language, basically in forms and, and certain masks, as Joe Campbell would say it. But it, uh, it, it's a matter of interpreting what those... in representations are because they talk about a dimension behind the mask or the appearance of the myth mm -hmm. and that is the spiritual dimension which is an essential world in Kabbalah we call it the metaphysical world and that is like coming forth into the world but we need a, a kind of medium intermediate mm. world to know what that spirit which is unseen is speaking to us so the myth is far more than just a psychological reference. It is a reference to a spiritual dimension behind it. And therefore, it, you can also use it in a religious or spiritual way. Mm. Yes, it's as much a 
um, is a kind of map as well as being a portal. And yeah. there, there's something, um, and what I've noticed is the deeper we, the deeper we go with this, the more that opens up to us. The, the it may may begin um, looking at it through, for example, the lens of Jung's work. I think yeah. initially when we start to think and work archetypally it can it can absolutely be really powerful when we're working at that kind of level of the psyche of the of mm-hmm. the parts of our mind that we're conscious of but the deeper we go the more we start to realize like wow this is this is bringing forth um things from the mystery from from the unknown yeah. from the beyond that yeah we don't necessarily have words for we don't have um a way of speaking about these things directly and yeah. yet we can we can access them we can experience them we can even embody them through that lens of myth definitely yes i agree with that very much yeah a good mm. explanation i couldn't do it better <laughs> <laughs> i think so yeah mm. no no i um yeah i fully agree and um um and if you want to actively work with the myth, then the translation psychologically of what the spirit tries to communicate to me, to us, in well, actually all the time, how to enact it within the world. Mm. Well, that's what we call a ritual, you know. Uh, mm. A ritual is an enactment of a myth, whether it be a holy mass or a, a seasonal celebration, doesn't matter, but we actually enact the mythological themes uh, through it mm. and you don't have to do a formal ritual you can also say uh, just in certain occasions on the day that may happen spontaneously is that's my enactment of the myth so i'll give you an example from the round table yesterday i was in amsterdam and uh, there were two eastern oriental people with huge uh, coffers with bags and they couldn't get them up the stairs and I was with a friend and I said wait a minute and I took the two bags and I said I'll help you and I'll just you know carry them up the stairs and that may be just a polite thing to do for me that's an enactment of the part of the chivalric code within the round table hmm. and it's a reference also to who am I helping not just the person but, you know, it's the participation in spirit with the other person. And that's the consciousness that, for me, um, dawns with these kinds of situations. That's mm. what the myth has done for me. Not just social politeness, but it brings something deeper. Oh, I that's yes. A good example. Mm. Yeah. I love that so much. Um <laughs> For me personally, and also, again, in the work that we do with others, Mm -hmm. what I began to see was present in archetypes and um, mythical figures was a kind of a combination of um, a kind of role model and blueprint and North Star that Mm -hmm. took us beyond what we typically see as possible. Again, yeah. in this modern world, we don't have much in the way, most of us don't have much in the way of these role models that are fully inhabiting mm. these really beautiful, powerful ways of being and living. And yet, and, it, and if we relate to the archetypes of being something, you know, dead, dusty, you know, mm. lost in time, they, they aren't accessible to us. But as we start to bring them back into our awareness, we realize like, my goodness, these things are alive. I can yeah. actually, you know, in, allow them to inhabit me. I can allow them to inspire me, call me forth, show me what what's actually possible that yeah. perhaps is beyond what my culture has told me is possible or my family has told me is possible or my experiences have told me is possible. Mm. Um, and the more that, and I think that's something that just hearing someone say it like I just have, um, isn't the same as getting a taste of that. As you say, that could be a spontaneous ritual or it could be um, one that's planned. But as we actually start to get a taste for ourselves of like, 
my goodness, I'm, I'm able to bring in um, awareness and gifts and powers. Mm. We understand like this is a reality that actually is something available to us. But my, my invitation to anyone listening is like, try this out for yourself if you haven't already, because there is nothing yeah. that matches the embodied experience of what we're talking about here. Oh yeah, I agree. And, and, and also even more, I would say from a, not just mythologic, but also a Kabbalistic perspective is uh, that's the whole meaning of myth that spirit embodies or acts itself out on a material plane. Mm. And, and you know what? It does it anyway. Although mm. we want to ignore myth and archetypes, or we just don't want to believe in them, but they are part of the psyche anyway. And if we do not discover them, they are playing out their own roles and drama and the whole opera, um, and we just don't know. Uh, yes. That's the conditioned lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, the, the poor frontal cortex or the ego doesn't have anything to say. That's the way it is. It can, mm. in a one-pointed way, direct ourselves somewhere. But it's like somebody who says, oh, I quit smoking. And that's a nice thing to say from the prefrontal cortex, that intention. But the archetypes in the back of the head, as it were, they are laughing there, you know, <laughs> off. Because... <laughs> um, they are much more powerful uh, mm. because they are not just images, but they are containers, as it were, of vehicles of, of spiritual essence. Yeah, that makes it so our our psyche so powerful. And of mm. course, we are not talking about a personal psyche here, but a transpersonal reservoir, from of which we can become conscious. And if we would behold and contain and understand the whole spectrum of all the archetypes uh yeah it's an extremely rich life and it becomes very potent at the same time mm. we can cooperate with these archetypes um, yes and again i would just want to say the the round table myth of all it's not better but its beauty is that it contains all the archetypes with mm. from low to high and from left to right because they're, within all the knights and ladies at the round table, you have them all. You know, mm. in Jungian terms, you have the trickster, the hunter, the warrior, the king, the queen, uh, the maiden, etc. They're all there. So, yeah, it's a, it's a rich uh, way of working. Mm. Oh, I love that you brought it to this. So before we dive deeper into the figures of the round table... I love yeah. what you said in terms of the truth is we are going to be enacting, embodying these archetypes anyway, because we can't help but do that. And the difference is whether we're going to make that conscious, whether we're going to move towards, um, I guess, the what we might describe as like a, a, the wholeness of that archetype or the light yeah. attributes of that, that archetype versus the shadow archetypes. And I think there's something so so helpful to recognize like this is happening anyway it's just a case of whether you're going to make that something conscious um yeah. i think i think that's so helpful and coming to what you were just saying there about the round table because this is this is the the fact of the matter often the the ways that archetypes can be most um i guess illuminating is when we see those parts of ourselves that perhaps we deem unwanted, unwelcome, and then we're able to come face to face with them in in the form of an archetype and start to befriend, understand what what's what's motivating this part of me, what's driving this part of me. Um, and so I love that because this is, again, so to keep just sort of dismissing something or denying it, pushing it away, you know, mm. it's still going to continue doing its work. Um, so bringing it back in the fold. And the great thing, again, is you're saying when we have these beautiful examples that show us these figures, bring them to life, we can start to um, create that relationship. So coming to <laughs> that tantalizing mention of the round table, um, I mean, it may well be that we dedicate a whole show 
specifically to going deep into the round table because I think we could have a, a really rich conversation about that. Okay. But for the moment, would you give um, a sense of some of how you might work with those figures, those different kind of archetypes, um, mm. and pre perhaps give some sort of exact examples as to, you know, how someone might be showing up and how they then might work with a particular figure um, in a beneficial way? Right. Yes, of course, we can. Um, I can give some examples for uh, from the years that... We have done the roundtable meetings here and gatherings. Um, I don't know if that's a good idea. So I'm asking you, Leon, uh, when we start a roundtable gathering, we always do an invocation. So that's like um, we try to heighten our sensitivity and consciousness mm. to, well, be able to better understand what we are going to do, to mm. lift ourselves out of the ordinary consciousness into a more vigilant kind of mm. consciousness and that's in itself also the invocation of a higher archetype and um you can do it in several ways we use often called it's a mythological poetic invocation the son of light which in christianity would be you know the christ figure or mm. in celtic mythology would be like the fire that brigitte brings from the earth Mm -hmm. So that's the sun of light. Um, and uh, it's, it's a real powerful poem or invocation. So I, my question is, we could do that invocation. Yes, let's. Now, and yes. with all the people who are listening and just to see what happens. Hmm. That, that so, I would love that. And perhaps um, if someone's driving, it might be best not to. <laughs> um, I'm guessing, you know, particularly those of us that are quite open and sensitive. I know that uh, certain things can put me into a, a, a kind of a trance in which it probably wouldn't be advisable for me to drive. So it might be if you're if you're that way inclined, perhaps wait until you're not driving. Very good point. I didn't think about it, but definitely Make mm -hmm. sure that you're safe wherever you are. Um, so you can do this thing with your eyes closed or open. And you can do it when you physically gather with companions at a physical round table. Mm -hmm. Or, well, like we are doing now, more digitally. Um, but let's see where it's going. So mm. I'll close my eyes in a, as an example. And we can imagine that we are sitting at a round table in the mythological castle of Camelot in the Great Hall. And you are sitting at a place that you have been sitting for a longer time. And you may recognize the companions on your right and left. Maybe even you are aware of those present who are unseen. And our attention is drawn to the center of the table. And there is a veiled object. And in a sense, we communicate with it. And because of this, this object starts to elevate itself. And because of its ascension, the veil is slowly sliding off, revealing to us a golden chalice. And out of the chalice rises a golden child. And you look into the eyes of the child And we hear, in the name of the Son of Light, the Son of Maria, foster son of Brigitte in Avalon, keystone to the arch of heaven, who joins as one the forks upholding the skies. His is the right hand, his is the left hand. His is the rainbow lettuce, all in rich fermented milk. We will go in his name unto the path to peace in all shapes of shapes, in all colors of colors. 
It is the Son of Light, the Son of Maria, saying, Speak in my name, and peace shall be given unto you. Enter in my name, and you shall in no wise be cast out. Do you see us here, O Son of Light? Says the Son of Light, I see. And from this point on, all the companions open their eyes again. And if you sit at the round table, you light your own candle, which is a part of that particular section that you're sitting at. So this is an example of an invocation and a particular archetype that's being addressed here. Mm. Um. I don't think that's put me in the best place to answer questions. So give me a moment to uh, <laughs> come back to a slightly more ordinary uh, awareness. Sure. So firstly, um, I really love that you invited us into that experience. I think there's, there's something, again, so... So potent in that invitation back to working with ritual, which again, I see as a kind of like lost art, a part, a part of our birthright that's so important that we reclaim and the space it opens us into and makes possible is, again, something that needs to be experienced to un be understood. So yeah. I think that was a, a really beautiful thing to um, guide us through. From from that place, how one how might one um, after that invocation, uh, for example, work with a particular archetype, a particular figure? Yeah. What what mm. might take place after that? Yeah, that's a very good question. Well, every companion at the round table, wherever you're sitting, whether you're a man or a woman, um, the fact that you have. Um, made a decision to be at the round table means you want to be on your quest mm. and you mm. all want to find your experience of the holy grail and that's not the same for everyone mm. um, it means that someone and this is also you can find this in all the stories of the knights and ladies some are on the quest for love others for a quest for justice or compassion etc so we meditate often on what is my particular quest at this very moment. Mm. And that quest often entails from my personal life to a higher state of my individuality mm. or myself in union terms, from the ego mm. to the self. How do I get there? And what do I need to get there? Mm. And... Um, so that asks often for introspection and a meditation. Mm -hmm. And you might say, oh, I need more um, clarity of mind, of my intellect. It's just an example. And, I don't think um, you're likely to say that to me, actually, are you? <laughs> <laughs> no coincidences. <laughs> exactly, you're right about it. And, um, and then through some knowledge of the archetypes, or you just you know, do some research alone or with the other companions, you might say, hmm, who in the round table mythology could help me here? Mm. And for example, you might find Sir Kay, uh, the half brother of King Arthur. So you dive into that archetype and you adopt it for the time being as your grail guide. That's mm. how we call it. Uh, not just at that moment, that session at the round table, but you try to uh, take him on board, so to speak, during different moments within your life. Mm -hmm. Come into a kind of conversation or a counseling with him. Um, <clears throat> so that would be the whole work for the mm -hmm. companion at the round table is, well, you know, what would Sir Kay do in this particular moment or in this mm -hmm. situation? Uh, and then the archetype comes much more alive within your consciousness and becomes really, um, yeah, 
maybe sounds strange, but an entity in its own right. Mm. And again, the archetype was already there. So you bring it from uh, lat latency to potency within yourself. Mm. And what you can do also is draw a second archetype or a card. We use cards often with, with the archetypes on it, the round table. And you say, that's my challenger mm -hmm. or opponent. So my helper is K and you can have a blind card or you do it because you know something that is in your way. Mm -hmm. And you say, oh, I draw such and such. So then you have this relationship, this challenge so to speak and then you start working for the time being at least like for two weeks when we gather again you come back and you say well Kay has helped me with organizing my mind in a particular way mm. and of course it's very subjective but that's what it's all about eventually mm. is, is that a good example oh a fabulous example yes mm. it's um Again, I think there's at least an episode in us going, you know, much deeper into many more of the figures. But I think that that really brings to life um, how one might work with those particular archetypes. And yes. like you're saying, I think there is um, something um, so helpful to have these ways of coming together to work with different archetypes but you know ultimately we're always on our own individual quest and yet working together with others uh, it's like the potency is magnified um, it's more than the sum of its parts I've certainly noticed that in uh, some of the work that we do when we're working in this way with archetypes and with different people, again, on their own individual quest, but often it's that um, the dance between different archetypes, say, for example, there might be someone working with an empress archetype, another person uh, mm. uh, working with, say, a priestess. And it's so helpful recognizing those different qualities of the different archetypes, but also being able to sort of see them uh, being embodied by someone else. And then what's that activating within us? And so there's something in what you're talking about here that I think is another level of potency that, again, we've already lost the we've lost the art of working with archetypes, which again, thankfully, we're reclaiming, but being able to work with them within uh, a community, within a group, I think is, again, another thing that allows us to inhabit them or be inhabited by them um, yeah. even more potently. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, extremely uh, important point. And the, the round table shows us this, that the whole archetypal world is about relationships, whether mm. it be between gods or angels or archangels. Um, but archetypes do not act on their own. Every mythology mm. tells us this. And of course, the round table in a circular fashion shows us that there is a continuous relationship and dynamic between the different archetypes. And the same, of course, happens within our own psyche. Mm. Uh, nothing stands on itself. Everything is interdependent. Um, so that's why the mythology itself works always through wholeness, if you use mm. it, and has a healing yes. property within itself. <clears throat> and, of course, the, 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 the circle form at the round table uh, returns, for example, also in astrology. Mm-hmm. So the astrological planets, which are gods in themselves, as you know, they can be used. What we do at the round table is uh, at the particular day of meeting, I have like little circles with the symbol or the tokens of the planets. And of course, you have 12 sections of the table. Mm -hmm. So we put the planets in the right houses or sections of the table. And we just look at those archetypal constellations and relationships at that very moment mm. that's another way of go, of course of looking at the archetypes mm -hmm. with the round table and then you can currently see oh you know what's the astrological weather of today mm. and uh, what does it mean to me uh, and maybe also to the world what would it what is shifting or what is happening according to the the uh, well the constellation at this very moment 
Mm. I'm really glad you um, brought brought this in, in that this has been something I've been pondering uh, off and on for some time. Um, so broadening it out to, say, for example, um, archetypes in astrology or in tarot, um, how, again, with this kind of modern mind, we can be so looking for a kind of empirical objective truth in them and then dismiss it when we can't see it and not recognizing that so much of the potency in them is is subjective and is meant to be subjective hmm. that that's the doorway isn't it doesn't mean therefore you know dismiss it because it's made up it's embrace hmm. it's embrace what it can offer when we are able to meet it on its own terms and aren't needing to look through that lens of, is this true? Can this be measured? Um, and I, I think the, you know, for example, when you were given the example, um, when you were saying about working with the figures of the round table, and you said, you know, it is subjective whether or not that change has happened, but that's kind of, that is the work. That's the magic. That's, that's the unfolding. And I think just the same, if we're talking about astrology or tarot or runes or anything else, anything with which we are kind of showing these, um, you know, big energies that are out of our usual conscious awareness yeah. And then entering their world on their terms, we have to mm. at some point kind of like let go of this need for it to make this objective, literal, rational truth because it just can't take us where we need to go. So I'd love before we're we're <laughs> almost up on time, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that before we close. Yeah, no, no, no. It's 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 just a fascinating uh, world, and indeed, our experience of the mythological world is subjective and our enactment within the world um, is subjective but at the same time the essential world uh, those those powers that you're talking about we can also describe them as spiritual constants mm. so the the myth the myth itself is like a construction of spiritual powers or constants within the universe they are macrocosmic and universal and and they talk to us through mythology that's the language that we understand mm. um and um, so there's this subjective but also objective component mm. within the experience of the myth <clears throat> and if we start to understand this and and embody it uh yeah that's that's really an extremely yeah potent but also um yeah, just a, a miraculous thing to work with, mm. I can almost say. So then, for example, you may work with the archetype of the king, which is the center of the heart, like King Arthur or Aragorn or uh, Charlemagne, whoever it is. Uh, it can also be a, um, a historical figure, of course, with uh, mythological components in him or her. Um, but at the same time, the essence of the king is of a spiritual metaphysical nature mm -hmm. and is universal. So everyone can experience it because it's universally present in all of us. And it's the power of centralization, of autonomy, of sovereignty. Um, but the experience we have of it is subjective. The problem, of course, always in the world until today is that these subjective experiences through you know, institutes are being objectified. Mm. So I'm going to tell you and the rest of the people in the program that my subjective experience is the experience. Mm -hmm. I try to objectify and then we are in trouble. Mm. Um, so that is, I think that's something I want to emphasize there. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a, a really, a really helpful addition. Mm. So, if someone's listening and perhaps they haven't yet consciously worked with archetypes in the way that we're describing, what would you suggest might be that first next step for them to begin that journey? I would say it's very straightforward and simple is but to find a myth that resonates with you. So that is close to your heart, the, the language of the myth 
it's like within the invocation, it's poetry. Mm. It's it's a language and uh, it's like a, a stream of images that should resonate with the heart and not with the head. So mm. find something that is really is really moving you. That is the first thing I would say. It doesn't matter where it comes from. It doesn't have to be from your own you know, uh, background or religion, wherever it comes from. That would be my first instruction there, my first mm. advice. Yeah. And then you will find almost like automatically one or two archetypes within that myth or story or legend that speaks to you. Mm. And then you can find the reason why it is calling to you. Um, that would be the first step, I would say, most important. Yes, I, I think that's uh, really, really wonderful advice. And I think uh, going back to what we were saying earlier about the, you know, we're going to be embodying and expressing these archetypes anyway, I would yeah. add, you know, there's going to likely be in those stories that call to you, the figures that you kind of feel this sense of, oh, I love that figure. I would love to have those uh, those traits. And there's also going to be the ones where you're like, that's the bad guy. You know, I, I hate the way they're showing up. <laughs> Notice yeah. both because both are going to have something really powerful to offer. Um, yeah. And if not to say these necessarily are going to be the... Um, the stories that are going to resonate with you. But I've done a few recently on the podcast, uh, one about the Lindworm and another one about Fox Woman, um, mm. where I tell the story and then offer ways of journeying with it. So that kind of serves a little bit like a blueprint that you could kind of journey with and then apply to other myths and stories that call to you. Wonderful. So this uh, this has been such a pleasure. Where can people find out more about you and the wonderful work you do, Mike? Yes, please. Um, well, I have two websites. The first is called circleofavalon.nl. So that's from the Netherlands NL, but it's all in English. And the other one is called kabbalamysticalschool.com. That's purely about my Kabbalistic work and courses, etc. And you can find me a little bit on social media, um, Facebook under my name, Mike Buys, or Circle of Avalon. So that's the, the school. There's two related pages there. Wonderful. That's the most important thing. Yeah. And I must admit, I'm super jealous of the people that live near you who actually go to your, uh, your roundtable meetings. I, I would absolutely love to be able to do that. Yeah. Well, again, I'm... I, uh, I'm always, uh, you know, very uh, enthusiastic for coming to the UK and teaching in London and Glastonbury and everything. So uh, I've just, of course, returned from the UK several times. But uh, as soon as I have an agenda, uh, then I will let you know and people can find it on the website. Wonderful. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you Can't so wait. much. Yes, I, I will be there. I will definitely be there. Thank you so much. This has been an absolute delight. For me too. Thank you. I very much hope you enjoyed watching that. And if you did and you're not already subscribed, then do hit that bell thingy and subscribe to automatically get each fresh new episode as it's released each week. If you'd like to find out more about the work we do at Be Mythical to guide and support old souls in this new world to live their own unique myth, do hop along to bemythical.com and you'll find out all the ways you can join us and go deeper with us on your own mythical journey. Lots of love for now. See you again next week.